so much. We're really pleased to be here at the Brennan Museum. And also, um, uh, part of this um, amazing photography exhibition, the uh, jazz memoir um, of Herb Snitzer. So we're talking about Jews and jazz, and there's some alliteration there for good reason. But the Jews and jazz, I think, really made their biggest contribution to, the, to American music as composers, publishers, also as musicians. But when you create a music, that is the, really the, the lifeblood of what the musicians play. And um, the, the music that, that the um, first generation of uh, Eastern European emigres that came over around the turn of the century, the music that they created really was an important part of the American songbook, the American experience, and how they were able to um, marry the, the, the frenzied energy of the turn of the century with ragtime music and of course jazz music coming up from New Orleans, from the Mississippi River, and, and the composers were looking at that. And, and the early um, um, emigrants from this period, the Russian Jews, they really were looking for um, a way to assimilate themselves into society. Um, one of the first um, important composers um, that I'd like to talk about is a man by the name of Irving Berlin. He was born in Russia, emigrated around the turn of the century. His father was a cantor. And he was one of the first composers to be able to combine the sound of ragtime music. Can you give me a little ragtime there, Gary? Of, of American music, late 19th, early 20th century, and he was able to incorporate that into popular songs from uh, uh, musicals, um, what they call vaudeville reviews. And um, the first piece we played was called Putting on the Ritz, is one of his famous compositions. It is from a um, film from 1927. The name of the film was called Putting on the Ritz. Putting on the Ritz refers to um, getting dressed up and going out and having a good time. And of course, 1927 is pre-stock market crash, so people had a bit of discretionary income. And of course, the movies portrayed this image, and the music really was an important part of the films, especially from 1927, 28, when they had sound. But something that people don't recognize or realize is that um, silent movies, even at the turn of the century, did have musical soundtracks. 
tracks. It's just the music was, was performed live. Um, I love Berlin's music. One of his other really important compositions and, uh, is a piece that he wrote um, in the 1940s and it was called Blue Skies. It's from a film from 1946. But Berlin really tried to assimilate into this new American culture and he was able to do it through his music and writing um, songs for Broadway. And his songbook is, is incredible. The man lived almost 100 years, but he's probably one of the early of the, the Jewish emigres, Russian Jewish emigres. Now you have to remember that Jews had been um, emigrating to this country way before that. The German Jews came from the mid 19th century and oftentimes they would um, maybe possibly look down as, as the, uh, the Russian Jews as, as their poor relatives, but there was maybe a bit of a tension between the two. We'll talk about that later. But, but Berlin really represents this first generation of composers to, to give um, popular musicians, and especially jazz musicians, the material that they needed to express themselves. Because you just can't be a jazz musician if you don't have anything to play. You, haven't, you don't have any songs. You have That's to have true. material. Absolutely. And this generation gave us amazing material. So I'd like to play um, Blue Skies, and um, um, it's a great tune. It's also the, um, the basis for, um, uh, was it Thelonious Monk's In Walk In Bud. Walk um, so jazz musicians have always been really attracted to these songs, number one for the melodies, and also because of the harmonies are so interesting. And then I'm gonna ask you to say a few words about this, Mr. Motley. Sure. So we'd like to play Blue Skies. Thank you. 
Exquisite piece of music written by Irving Berlin, recorded many times by great singers and instrumentalists. Again, the jazz musicians had to have material that reflected the signs of the time. And of course, this music was, um, was part of it. It was built into the culture of the first 50 years of the 20th century, especially from this period from um, mid-teens up to the mid-1940s. Berlin was the first of these great Russian emigre, um, Eastern European composers to assimilate um, into society, and, es and especially with the entertainment business. He gave us great material and a lot of it. But let's talk about that particular song. What is kind of interesting about it? Well, <clears throat> Gordon, you mentioned earlier on talking about um, kind of the history of, of how these these musics come together, and there's there's a great tradition of of um, diatonic music that comes out of out of out of uh, classical, and so you hear that you hear that sound uh, in the music, and yet when we talk about like the the stride piano things, the uh, uh, let's say we we'll do it here. You know, the stride piano thing that became really kind of an Americana sort of thing. But if we look at the history of it, um, the African tradition that comes into this music is really based on, on rhythm. So if you look at, for example, the trade routes of, of slaves being brought from Africa through South America and then eventually up through Central America and to the United States, there's an interesting influence of, of tango. So that if you listen to this with the tango rhythm, Well, it's the same thing. Same thing, different rhythm. So we start bringing these things together, and that's what you're hearing. Uh, one of the other things that's really interesting to note about this music is that, for example, during the Harlem Renaissance, that was when uh, there was just this explosion of creativity in, in music and dance and, and different forms of, of expression. So um, that being said, everybody was kind of wanting to know what was happening in the scene, and the scene, of course, was Harlem. So Gershwin and everybody else w was going up to Harlem, you know, for the late night shows and checking out what was going on. And if you think about it, especially like with, with somebody like Gershwin, gets that sound in their ear, man, it's infectious. And all of a sudden, when you go back to your writing, now you've got this whole new palette of things that you're able to use as a vehicle for, for expression. Conversely, the same thing happens um, for jazz musicians, that they're hearing these, these classical things and they're bringing all of these things together. So that's where we get this amalgam that becomes this unique um, experience that develops out of that period. It's our, it's our cultural fabric that we've woven all of these amazing sounds, the sounds of African music, um, sounds of New Orleans, and of course, uh, jazz is, is primarily an African-derived uh, style of music. It's a way of playing, um, but these, early, these, these composers wanted to assimilate that sound into popular music. Plus, there's a huge business. There's a publishing business. There's a printing business. There's lots of opportunities, um, and of course, the film industry is really, um, really coming into its own, and of course, the records and everything, so it all, it all ties in. Um, at this period, there were some of the greatest songwriters, or we call them tunesmiths from Tin Pan Alley, include people like George and Ira Gershwin, Jerome Kern, uh, Irving Berlin, Yip Harbor, Richard Rogers, Oscar Hammerstein, Harold Arlen, one of my favorites, Arthur Schwartz, just to name a few. 
And so um, one of the great songwriters from this period who was not Jewish was Cole Porter. And he told his friends, he confided, he said, God, I wish I was Jewish or I could write like you guys, like you do. <laughs> but he was also a great composer in his own right. But um, it's really interesting how these composers really began to um, assimilate this music and make it at a u uniquely American music and, and integrate those sounds, the sounds of the tango, that kind of minor-ish sound, those kind of blue notes, those off-key notes, it's all, it all, it all relates. You know, we're all from the same gene pool, so if you, if you peel back the layers, you're still gonna, you're gonna find things, you're gonna find similarities. Um, one of the great composers, and you, you mentioned his name, um, who were one of the first to really um, incorporate the sounds of this, the blues in, into his music, um, was George Gershwin. He was, again, um, Eastern European born, um, and uh, he and his brother were, were trained. Actually, Gershwin studied classical music. He studied, um, I believe, uh, what was it, the, the Shankarian uh, with, with Albert Shanker, mm -hmm. the, the Sh Shankarian analysis. So he also wrote classical music, um, but he's really known for his, the music that he wrote for movies and for um, uh, films. Um, one of the most important pieces um, that he did, of course, was Rhapsody in Blue, which was premiered by Paul Whiteman in 1924 at Aeolian Hall, an amazing piece of music that really combines a lot of things that were, that were percolating in American culture and American music and the American um, music business. But probably one of his great contributions to American music is his opera, Porgy and Bess, based on a novel by Debose Hayward. Um, in that song, in that, in that particular um, opera, it's, the music is just spectacular. But he went and he stayed in the Georgia Sea Islands for one summer studying the Gullah culture, studying the, um, the, the, the patterns, the rhythmic patterns of the speech, and then he wrote this amazing music, and the words are by um, Debose Hayward. So I'd like to play one of the really, really um, well-known, one of the great tunes that he wrote, and this is called Summertime, and I'm sure you're going to recognize this.
also has a sense of the blues and um, the pitch bending, of course, in, you know, coming together in this amazing music that we call jazz. Now, there were great jazz, uh, Jewish jazz musicians in this period. Probably the most famous was, was Benny Goodman. But there was also Artie Shaw, Ziggy, Ziggy Ellman. I have a list of some of the important Jewish jazz musicians. I know it's here. Oh, there it is. But Goodman and Shaw were probably the two most famous of the Jewish jazz musicians. And what's really interesting about the two of them, they pretty much denied their, their Jewish heritage. They both married outside their religion, which at this period was, wasn't unheard of, but it was kind of unusual. Goodman, as great a jazz musician as he was, was kind of an, an odd, odd man at times. But he did some amazing things musically with his orchestra. Also, he was one of the first jazz musicians, musicians to break the color barrier by hiring African-American musicians in a period where it wasn't done. In fact, in the 1930s, because of that, in the 40s, he didn't tour the, the Deep South because it was against the law. Jim Crow laws um, really ruled the Deep South. It wasn't that long ago. So he did break some barriers, but I think ultimately with Goodman, his focus was on the music and, and of course, making, making a living, which he did very well. He was a brilliant, brilliant technician. Artie Shaw, another brilliant Jewish jazz musician from that period. Um, and people, you know, there's two, um, uh, there's two sides of this because some people say that Shaw was the more creative one and the other one had more technique, but they were both brilliant musicians. Artie Shaw left the business because he didn't like the business. He loved music, but he didn't like the business. At the height of his career, he just basically quit. Had a long career, and I was able to hear him talk once at one of the IAJE conferences when he was in his, probably close to his 90s, and it was, it was fascinating. He still had all his faculties. A very, very um, crusty old fellow, but, but, but brilliant. And of course, there was Ziggy Eldman, the great um, Yiddish trumpet player who could play, who, who, who incorporated uh, klezmer music in the Freilichs, in, in his. Um, when, when he would play, if you listen to And the Angels Sing, and of course, which we're going to play later, by Mir Bistushane, when he incorporated that in, in his music. But you hear bits and pieces of it, but this is American music. And the American music built in, that's woven into our culture has, has, has um, uh, derives DNA from a variety of different sources. And the most important thing with all these people, they just wanted to be American. They wanted to be assimilated into society. That's, that was what they wanted. They just wanted to be assimilated. And they all faced horrific um, um, discrimination. African Americans, um, Italian Americans, Jews, Asians. And, but they wanted to be American. And the one common denominator that they all had was music. One of, um, for jazz musicians, one of uh, Gershwin's most famous and beloved pieces is a song, a little ditty that he tossed off, and he called it, I've Got Rhythm. Sometimes we just call it, I Got Rhythm. Sometimes we just call it Rhythm. And it was written for a, um, uh, let's see, it was written for a musical called um, Girl Crazy. Also, from that particular musical, from 1928, came, came a song called Of The I Sing, also Embraceable You and But Not For Me, came out of that musical. Oftentimes composers back then would write a song and it would appear in a number of different films or musicals or reviews and they'd kind of have to figure out where would this song fit the best. And um, it's a very simple song written in 1928 and um, it has a very basic chord progression that jazz musicians have loved for generations and have built upon that. I would say probably about half of the material that the bebop musicians in the 40s were playing was based on I Got Rhythm. In fact, today, if you go to a jam session, you just say, rhythm changes. And we know it's George Gershwin's I Got Rhythm. So we're going to play the song as it was originally written. And in the um, Snitzer's uh, jazz memoir, the, the photographs, he has quite a few pictures of Count Basie and Lester Young. In one of the most famous, we call it a contrafaction, you're not allowed to um, copyright a chord progression. You can copyright a melody. So if you strip off 
the melody, the chord progression remains, and you can insert a newly composed song. We call that a contrafaction. It's been around for hundreds, if not thousands of years. And this is the song that's probably the most, or the blues is probably the one that's most often <laughs> contrafacted. But this is probably second right after that. So this is I Got Rhythm, as Gershwin wrote it in 1928 with a little tag on the end. One, two, one, two, three, four.
So that is our homage to Lester Young and Count Basie. They recorded that in 1938 in New York City. Actually, I think it was, it was Chicago on the way to New York City. I, I could be mistaken. I should know this. But it's a very famous recording. It's Lester Young featured with Count Basie. Small group. And it, it is an amazing recording. And those pictures um, in the exhibit, the jazz memoir um, of uh, Lester Young, really capture, you know, his, I guess, his laconic approach to playing. I mean, he revolutionized the way the saxophone was played in the late 30s and all the beboppers and the cool jazz musicians in the late 40s really copied him. And of course, the Count Basie Orchestra taught us how to swing. swing. So we took George Gershwin's I Got Rhythm and then we played the contrafaction written by Lester Young and that was called um, Lester Leaps In. Now the other side of Gershwin, he could write the most beautiful love songs. They all could. But this one is one of my favorites. Let's just do one chorus of this one. This is called um, Our Love is Here to Stay. And it was written the year before Gershwin passed away. He died so young. Um, and this was written in 1938. And this was from a, um, a movie called The Goldwyn Follies. Oh, that's just a gorgeous song, recorded thousands of times. One of the things about these great um, songwriters from this period that provided this amazing material for all the great jazz musicians and pop musicians is if someone wrote a, a hit song, it was recorded immediately by every pop star. It doesn't happen today in pop music. You know, we always associate a song by the Beatles as by the Beatles, and it's almost like sacrilege for someone else to record a Beatles tune. Um, of course, it, it happens now because I just picked that out of the air. But back in the day, that particular song was recorded by big bands, by horn players, by singers. It was recorded in different languages. Um, it was just the way the business was run in those days. But Gershwin really, um, even in his short career, really carved out a real niche for him. And he also wrote classical music, not classical, he wrote orchestral music. Some of the critics weren't too kind, but you know you can just chalk that up to jealousy, I guess, professional jealousy. <laughs> but he wrote some amazing music, and his score to American in Paris is is still just a mag magnificent piece of music. Now, um, there were also, if you'll just permit me to look at my notes here for a second, because there's so many names. Um, the there were a lot of um, oh, here it is. Jews that were in, involved in the club business, the business side of it, providing an environment. And of course, you know, most club owners, 
they don't get a really good, have a great reputation. But it's, it's a difficult business, to say the least. Probably the most revered of the Jewish club owners was a man by the name of Barney Josephson. Barney operated a club called Cafe Society. There was no color line in this place. And it was the unofficial home of Billie Holiday. Mm -hmm. That's where she performed all the time. She would come out and do her signature piece, Strange Fruit. And there'd be a, 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 a pin spotlight on her, and she would do it. That was Barney Josephs and made that possible for her. He was really um, a pioneer in terms of, of race relations and in everyone's equal and civil rights. But some of the mo really important people, remember, Norman Granz, George Wine, Billy Shaw, Monty Kay, Symphony Sid Torrin, Joe Glazer, Max Gordon, ran the, the Village Vanguard for, since 1935. He's both, he and his wife have passed on. And uh, the, I think one of the daughters or granddaughters is running the Village Vanguard since the 1930s. Mo Gale, oh boy, he had a hell of a reputation. Panonica de Karnigsvarter. She was known as the patron of all the jazz musicians. She was uh, a relative of the, um, the Rothschilds. Mm -hmm. And she helped countless jazz musicians in the 40s and 50s. Uh, many pieces were written and dedicated to her. Morris Levy, and there's a piece of work, uh, Roulette Records, and also ran Birdland Jazz Club. Very colorful characters. Barney Joseph, Leonard Chess, Chess Records, Moses Ash, Folkway Records, Jerry Wexler, Teddy Rieg, Herman Lewinsky, Lester Koenig, who ran uh, Contemporary Records, Milt Gabler, Bob Weinstock, Francis Lyon, and uh, Robert Lyon, and uh, Francis Wolf, Bob Lyon, the two pioneers of... Blue Note, Blue Note Records. So there's, you know, there's the music, there's the business part, and you know, of course, you know, we can, you know, we can look back with um, 2020 eyes at the 1930s and 40s and, and, and just say exploitation. But that's the balance that the musicians had to face then was assimilation or exploitation. And the balance is being able to, to um, uh, contribute to the art form, yet try to maintain, maintain some sense of decency. You want to add anything to that? Sure. That, <clears throat> that has actually been a, a point of contention uh, when we look at the history of the music. As you say, you know, this, this marriage um, is, is it's a very complex um, uh, thing that happens there. Um, it was interesting because on the side of it from, from, from the African-American perspective, it was uh, this partnership that enabled a lot of the black musicians and composers uh, to get their music published. Um, striking that balance between, uh, as you say, art, art, and commerce. And yeah, that was a very um, slippery slope, but mm -hmm. for example, uh, it was Irving Mills um, and publishing and, and being able to get a lot of music out there that might not have been, been heard otherwise. So, um, yeah, and this is, again, this is a unique uh, thing that has happened in, in American, in the history of American jazz that gave us the sounds that we got from that period, gave us the styles that we got, and it was because of this cross-pollinization that all of that happened. This relationship, sometimes it was symbiotic, but it's just, you know, again, we can't, we have to look at, at this period, not with 2020 eyes, but from the period that these people were just trying to exist and make a living. And they left us with an incredible legacy of music and recordings. Um, one of the most uh, interesting songs from this period is a piece called By Mir Bistu Shane. It was written, um, it's a popular Yiddish song. The translation is, uh, to me, you're beautiful, written by uh, Jacob Jacobs and Sholem Sekunda, um, is, uh, was for a 1932 Yiddish uh, language comedy. The original version, ba -ba -ba -ba, um, five years later, the song was mildly popular, and a German, Germanicized title by Mir Bistushon by the Andrews sisters in 1937 skyrocketed that song to national, international popularity. And then, of course, it was recorded by everyone you can imagine. It was Benny Goodman, um, the Andrews Sisters. Um, it was just incredibly popular. One of the interesting things about By Mir Bistu Shane is that um, um, it was uh, translated into, into German. And in Nazi Germany, um, it 
was quite a popular song. Do you see the irony there? And then when they found out who had written the song and what their original intention was, they promptly pulled it off the market. But it was an incredibly popular song. It's one of the few times that an actually um, a Yiddish song would make, um, could be transferred or translated into American pop music. Sammy Kahn wrote the English lyrics to it in the 1930s. He said the first time he heard it was in a black nightclub performed by two black singers. And they were singing it in Yiddish. And he was so taken with it that he wrote English lyrics to it. So Gary and I are going to play by Mir Bistur Shanti for you. has been made it very difficult for performers, whether it's comedians, singers, dancers, chamber music, jazz, pop. It's been, it's been really hard for us. And, uh, but we figure out how to keep this art form, this, this music alive. We have to keep everything alive because culture is, is, is really what separates us from 
kind of, I guess I always said lower forms of life that don't appreciate the beautiful things, whether it's a, a painting or a, a poem or a, an amazing piece of music or a John Coltrane's recording of Alabama, which still gives me goosebumps. But we have to keep on keeping on doing this because this is really the, the human spirit and soul really needs performers, interpreters, but we also need material. And I think that's the biggest um, contribution here that I, I hope I'm making that amply clear. Also, I want to talk about, um, there are some important, oh, I, I can do this, I can do this. Um, writers, critics, who really um, brought this music um, to the forefront in terms of writing intelligent essays about jazz. People like Leonard Feather, just excuse me for a second while I'm rustling through my stuff here. Oh, here we are. Sorry. Irving Colladin was one of the first writers to appreciate and understand that something was happening here. Barry Ulanoff, Leonard Feather, Robert Gottlieb, Nat Hentoff, Gary Giddens, Ira Gittler, Nat Shapiro, Howard Mandel, Sidney Finkelstein, David Rosenthal, Leroy Estransky, Dan Morgenstern, Charles Hirsch wrote this amazing book that I used for a lot of this information. Thank you, Charles, if you're out there. Um, great writer, Mez Mesro, Frank Hofsky, Leonard Bernstein. This is just a handful of those important compose, uh, uh, writers who wrote intelligently and succinctly about this music that people were so willing to dismiss because of its origins. They recognized that this is something really special and they wrote about it beautifully. My, li my personal library is full of books by these, these gentlemen. And of course, a whole new generation of writers is out there um, keeping the um, flame alive. But these, uh, com these writers are really important also. Um, we're going to close this up pretty soon. But my favorite composer from this period, the one who I believe really was able to capture the sound of the blues and the plaintive sound of, of African-American music from the 19th century. And, and, and incorporated into popular music it was a man by the name of Harold Arlen. Of course, that's not his given name. He was a Russian emigre. His father was a cantor. He wrote some of the most amazing songs. He collaborated with some of the greatest um, songwriters. And uh, one of my favorite um, collaborations, you know, he, he worked with um, Johnny Mercer. And uh, on this particular song, we're going to do. Um, Stormy Weather. Okay. We're going to do two pieces. Now, Stormy Weather was written for a 1933 musical review. Back in those days in Harlem, in every nightclub, even in Harlem and Broadway, had what they call musical reviews. It was like a variety show. And they hired the most amazing composers to write this great music. And this piece was written for one of my heroes from this period. And she's often overlooked. Her name was Ethel Waters. She was a great singer back in the 20s and 30s. And people mostly remember her today as a, as a, um, a character in, in movies. So oftentimes it took the part of a, um, an, an older or an elderly woman. But back in the day, she was a spectacular singer. And we can't forget about Ethel Waters. She was really what they call a piece of work. This song was written for her. been recorded hundreds of times. Um, Lena Horne recorded it, um, but back in the movie Cabin in the Sky, I did some research, and Lena Horne did not sing this song. It was Ethel Waters. Ethel Waters. So, Stormy Weather. <laughs>
So we're going to leave you with uh, one last um, Arlen song. I want to thank Leslie Gordon here at the Bremen Museum for making this possible. Leslie, where are you? And she and I have been collaborating for 20 plus years on a lot of projects and she's one of my favorite people. I want to thank my friend Eddie Harlequeu over here who's doing the videography. My dear friend Gary Motley who I've, we've been collaborating for close to 30 years on yeah. projects and he's a consummate musician, great pianist, great pedagogue, great teacher and he's just a dear friend. I'm really honored to have him uh, share the stage with me. So um, this last piece we're going to play um, Blues in the Night really captures Arlen at his best. Now, Arlen also wrote another song that is so amazing that even to this day when I hear it and I play it, I get um, verklempt. <laughs> he wrote <laughs> Over the Rainbow. We're not going to play that for you. But we're going to end with um, this song, Blues in the Night, lyrics by the great Johnny Mercer, of course, from Savannah, Georgia. Um, and it's a perfect marriage of the sound of the blues captured by this European Russian Jew composer <laughs> who changed his name to Harold Arlen and Johnny Mercer, born and raised in Savannah. It's just a marriage made in heaven, that, that collaboration. Apparently, the, the story is that they performed it somewhere at a, at a party and people just lost their minds. They just said, we have to record this. And it's one of the most often recorded songs in, from this particular period. And I know Gary wants to say something because he's got, he, this man has so many projects going. Tell us about that one project you have going. Oh, right now um, I just released a uh, new CD. It's uh, entitled Tone Poems. And uh, it is a collection of improvisations that are uh, a way of kind of um, looking at everything that's been happening lately and finding an artistic way to explore that. And uh, as a friend of mine uh, called it, tone therapy. <laughs> so uh, I invite uh, those of you who are interested, uh, you can get that on any of your digital streaming platforms. It's called Tone Poems. So that's one of the things that's been keeping me really busy here these days. You know, I'm not going to run out and buy that today because you, you can't. I have to go to the cloud. Yes. I don't, I don't, I don't want to go to the cloud. I, I'm old school. I want to have an LP in front of you, but I'm sure to check that out. I want to thank you so much, and we're going to leave you with Blues in the Night, um, song by, uh, written by Harold Arlen with lyrics by the great Johnny Mercer. Sure.
Thank you.